Hello, my wonderful Ravenaps. This is Matt Raven here, and today we're gonna go back into the darkness. We're gonna go back into our slash no sleep. So, turn off the lights, get comfortable, grab your stuffed animal and your crucifix, and let's dive deep into the darkness once again. I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. I have some stories to tell, part three. Well, once again, you guys have blown me away with your staggering amount of responses to my stories. There's no way I can respond to each of you individually, so I'm just going to add address some common things again, and then move on to stories. I'm going to write as many as I can think of in addition to my friends' stories. Now, I'll probably not update again until I get a chance to answer some questions that I myself have for my superiors. Alright, so the common questions I found you all had. I'm not comfortable talking about where exactly I work, unfortunately. In all reality, some of the things I mentioned here could get me in a lot of trouble or fired, so it's best if I don't discuss too much. I will say that I'm in the United States in an area that compromised a, of a great deal of wilderness. We're talking hundreds of miles of thick forest with a mountain range and a few lakes. There's still a great amount of interest in the stairs, and luckily for you guys, my friend has a story that I think you'll all be very interested in. I'll go into that more at the end of this update. As for whether or not I've ever thought of asking my superiors about them, I have, but again, I don't risk my job. However, one of my former superiors no longer works as an SAR officer, and it's possible that he may be willing to talk to me about it. I'll be speaking to him later this week, and I'll let you all know what comes to that. As far as advice on becoming an SAR officer goes, I think the best advice I can give is to contact your local Forest Service office and see if they offer any training courses, what the qualifications are. I've been doing this for years, and I started out as a volunteer helping on SAR operations. It's a great job, despite the occasional tragic situations, and I wouldn't want to do anything else. Alright, let's move on to the stories. The first time on a case that I went on out on right after I got out of training, and it was still pretty and I was still pretty new to everything. Before I took this job, I was a volunteer, so I had a basic idea of what to expect. But on these those calls you're mostly dealing with finding lost people after vets have found signs of them. As an SAR officer, you go out for all kinds of cases, from animal bites to heart attacks. This case got called in early in the morning from a young couple who were up on one of the trails that goes by the lake. The husband was completely hysterical. We couldn't really figure out what was going on. You could hear this woman screaming in the background, and he was begging us to come up there right away. When we get there, we see him holding his wife, and she's got something in her arms. She's screaming these awful, almost animal-like screams, and he's sobbing. He sees us, and he screams at us to help them, to please get an ambulance there. Now, obviously, we can't just drive an ambulance up the walking path, so we ask him if his wife needs help or if she can walk on her own. He's still hysterical, but he manages to tell us that it's not his wife that needs help. I go over while one of the vets tries to calm him down, and I ask what the wife what's going on she's rocking holding something and just shrieking over and over i crouch down and see that whatever she's holding it's covering her with blood that's when i notice a sling on her front my heart sinks i ask her to tell me what's going on and i sort of pry her arms gently open so i can see what she's holding it's her baby obviously dead his head is caved in on one side and he's covered in scratches now i've seen dead bodies before but something about this whole situation hit me hard. I have to take a second to compose myself, and I get up and go get one of the other vets who's standing by. I tell him that it's a dead kid, and he sort of pats me on my shoulder and tells me he'll deal with it. It took us over an hour to get this woman to let us see her kid. Every time we try to take him from her, she flips out and tells us we can't have him, that he'll be okay if we just leave her alone and let her help him. But eventually, one of the vets manages to calm her down, and she gives us the body. Took it back to med area, but when the EMT showed up, they told us there was never any hope of saving the kid. He died instantly from the trauma to his to his head. I was good buddies when the nurses who met them at the hospital. She told me later what had happened. Turns out the couple had been walking with the baby in the sling, and they'd stopped because the kid was fussing. The dad takes the kid and is holding it, looking out over this little gully by the path. The mom comes to stand next to him, but she ends up stepping on a loose patch of soil and she trips. She falls into the dad, who drops the kid who ends up falling about 20 feet down this little gully into rocks at the bottom. Dad climbed down and recovered his kid, but he'd fallen right on his head. and he was dead by the time he got there. The baby was only about 15 months old. It was a total freak accident. A series of events that coalesced into the worst possible outcome. Probably one of the most awful calls I've ever been on. I haven't seen a lot of animal bites in my time as an SAR officer, mostly because there aren't that many animals that come around this area. While there are bears in the area, they tend to stay pretty far away from people, and sightings are highly unusual. Most of the animals you see are small ones, like coyotes, raccoons, or skunks. What we do see frequently, though, are moose. And let me tell you, moose are nasty fuckers. They'll chase after anything for any reason, and God help you if you get in between a female and its baby. 
one of the more amusing calls was of a guy who'd gotten chased down by an absolutely massive male moose and was stuck up a tree. It took us almost an hour to get him down. When we was finally on the hall of the ground again, he looked at me and said, God damn, them folks is big up close. I guess that's not really a scary story, <laughs> but we still laugh about that one. I honestly don't know how I'd forgotten the story, but it is by far the scariest thing that's happened to me. I guess maybe I've tried so long to forget about it that it just didn't come to mind right away. As someone who spends literally all their time in the woods, you don't ever want to let yourself get scared of being alone or out in the middle of nowhere. That's why when you have experiences like this, you tend to just forget about them and move on. This, to date, the only thing that's ever made me really seriously consider if this is the right one for me. I don't really like talking about it much, but I'll do the best I can to remember it all. As I recall, this took place that right at the end of spring. It was a typical lost child case. A four-year-old girl had wandered away from her family campsite and had been missing for about two hours. Her parents were completely despondent. Told us what most parents do. My kid would never wander away. She's so good about staying close. She's never done anything like this before. We show the parents that we'll do everything we can to find her, and we spread out in a standard search formation. I was partnered with one of my good buddies, and we were sort of casually holding conversation while we hiked. I know it sounds callous, but you do sort of become desensitized when you've done this long enough. It becomes the norm. I think to a certain extent, you have to learn to desensitize yourself in order to work this job. We searched her for a good two hours, going well beyond where we think she'd be. We come out of a small valley when something makes us both stop in unison. We freeze and look at each other, and there's like almost a sensation like a plane depressurizing. My ears pop, and I have this odd sensation of having dropped about ten feet. I start to ask my buddy if he felt that, but before I can, we hear the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. It's almost like a freight train passing directly by us, but it's coming from every direction at once, including above and below us. He screams something to me. I can't hear him over this deafening roar. Understandably freak out, we look all around us, trying to find a source of sound, but neither of us sees anything. Of course, my first thought is a landslide, but we're not near any cliffs, and if we were, it would have hit us by now. The sound goes on and on, we're trying to yell at each other, but even standing close together, we can't hear anything but the sound. Then, as suddenly as it starts, it stops, like someone threw a switch and just cut it off. We stand there for a second, perfectly still, and slowly, the normal sounds of the woods come back. He asked me what the fuck just happened, but I just kind of shrug and we stand there looking at each other for a minute. I got, got on the radio and asked if anyone else just heard the world, the end of the fucking world, but no one else heard it, even though we were all within shouting distance of each other. My buddy and I just sort of shrug it off and keep going. About an hour later, we check up on the radios and no one's found the little girl. Most of the time, we won't search when it gets dark, but because we don't have any kind of lead on her, a few of us decide to keep going, including me and my buddy, to keep close together and we're calling out for her every couple minutes. At this point, I'm hoping beyond hope that we find her. Because while I may not like kids, the idea of them being out all alone in the dark is an awful thing. The woods can be intimidating to kids, even in the daylight. At night, well, it's a whole different beast. But we're not seeing any signs of her yet, or we're getting any response, and around midnight, we decided to turn around and head back to rendezvous point. We're about halfway back, my buddy stops and shines his lights right of us into a really thick deadfall, or a group of dead trees. I ask him if he'd heard a response, but he just tells me to be quiet a second, and I listen. I do, and in the distance I hear what sounds like a kid crying. Both call the girl's name and listen for any kind of response, but just this really faint crying. We head in the direction of this deadfall and go around it, calling her name over and over. As we get closer to this crying, I start getting this weird feeling in my gut. I tell my buddy that something isn't right. He tells me he feels the same way, but we can't figure out what it is. We stop where we are and call the girl's name again, the same time we both figure it out. The crying is on a loop. It's the same hitching sob, then a wail, then a quiet hiccup, repeated over and over. It's exactly the same every time. Without saying another word, we both take off running. It's the only time I've ever lost my composure like that. But something was so incredibly wrong, neither of us wanted to stay out there anymore. When we got back to the rendezvous, we asked if anyone else heard anything strange, but no one else knew what we were talking about. I know it sounds sort of anticlimactic, but that call fucked me up for a long time. I said, little girl, never found a trace of her. We keep an eye out for her, and all the other people we've never found, but frankly, I doubt we'll ever find anything. Of the missing person's calls I've gone out on, only a handful have resulted in complete disappearances, meaning no trace of the person and no body ever found. But sometimes, finding a body just leads to more questions than answered. Here are some of the bodies we found that have become infamous in our team. Teenage boy whose remains were covered almost a year after he vanished. We found the top of his skull, two finger bones, and his camera, almost 40 miles away from where he was last seen. The camera, sadly, was destroyed. The pelvis of an older man had vanished a month earlier. That's all we found. 
the lower jaw and right foot of a two-year-old boy on the high, highest peak of a ridge in the southern part of the park. The body of a 10-year-old boy is Down syndrome, almost 20 miles from where she vanished. She had died of exposure three weeks after going missing, and all of her clothes were intact except for her shoes and jacket. There were berries and cooked meat in her stomach when they did the autopsy. Coroners had appeared as if someone had been taking care of her. There were never any suspects identified. The frozen body of a one-year-old baby, found a week after vanishing in the hollow trunk of a tree, ten miles from the area where he was last seen. There was fresh milk found in his stomach, but his tongue was gone. A single vertebra and the right kneecap of a three-year-old girl found the snow almost twenty miles from a campground her family had been at the previous summer. Now on to a couple of the stories my friend told me. I mentioned that you were all interested in the stairs, and here I'm luck. He's had a close encounter with them. Though he doesn't have any explanation for them, he does have a bit more experience with them than I do. My buddy has been an SAR officer for about seven years. He started when he was a junior in college, and he had a very similar experience when he first encountered the stairs. His trainer told him almost the same thing mine did, which was never to go near, touch, or send them. For the first year, he did just that. Apparently, his curiosity got the better of him. On one call, he broke away from the line and went to go check out a set of them. He said they were about ten miles from the path that it, where a teenage girl had vanished, and the dogs were following his scent. He was on his own, lagging behind the main group when he saw a set of stairs off to the left. It looked like they were from a new house, because the carpeting was pristine and white. He said as he got closer, he didn't feel any different, or hear any weird noises. He was expecting something to happen, like bleeding from his ears or collapsing. But he got right up next to them and didn't feel anything. The only thing he said what that was odd was that there was absolutely no debris on the steps, no dirt, leaves, dust, anything. There didn't appear to be any signs of animal or insect activity in the media area, which he also found strange. It was less like things were avoiding them, more like they just happened to be in a relatively barren part of the forest. He touched the stairs and didn't feel anything except that sort of sticky feeling you get from a new carpet. Making sure his radio was on, he slowly climbed up the stairs. He said it was terrifying because of the way they had been stigmatized. He wasn't really sure what was going to happen to him. He joked that half of them expected to be teleported to some other dimension and the other half was watching for a UFO to come swooping down. He got to the top of the little event and just stood there, looking around. But he said the longer he stood on the top step, the more he felt like he was doing something very, very wrong. He described it as the feeling you get if you were in a part of a government building you have no business being in. As if someone was going to come and arrest you or shoot in the back of the head at any second. He tried to brush it off, but the feeling got stronger and stronger. And that's when he realized he couldn't hear anything anymore. The sounds of the forest were gone. He couldn't even hear his own breathing. It was like some kind of awful, weird, awful tinnitus. But more oppressive. Climbed back down and rejoined the search and didn't mention what he'd done. But he said the weirdest part came after. His trainer was waiting him back to the welcome center after the search ended for the day, and he cornered my buddy before he could leave. He said his trainer had this look of intense anger, and he asked what was wrong. You went up then, didn't you? My buddy said it wasn't phrased as a question. He asked how his trainer knew. The trainer shook his head, because we didn't find her. The dogs lost a scent. My buddy asked if that had to do with anything. The trainer said, asked how long he'd been on the stairs, and my buddy said no more than a minute. The trainer gave him this really awful, almost dead-eyed look and told him if he ever went up another set of stairs again, he'd be fired. Immediately. The trainer walked away. I guess he's never answered any of the questions my buddy has asked about him about it since. My buddy's been involved in a lot of missing persons cases where there's never been a trace of them found. I mentioned David Paulides, and my buddy said he confirmed that those stories are, for the most part, accurate. He said that most of the time, if the person isn't found right away, they're either never found, or they're found months, we weeks, months, or years later, in places they can't possibly have gotten to. One story he told me that really stood out involved a five-year-old boy with a severe mental disability. The little boy vanished from picnic area in the late fall. In addition to mental disability, he was also physically handicapped, and his parents explained over and over that he simply could not have vanished. It was impossible. Someone had to have taken him. My buddy said they searched for that this kid for weeks, going miles out of the accepted range. It was like he'd never been there. The dogs couldn't pick up scent anywhere. Not even the picnic area he would apparently vanish from. Suspicion fell on the parents, but it was pretty clear that they were devastated and hadn't done anything sinister to their kid. The search was concluded about a month later. My buddy said everyone had pretty much forgotten it by later in the winter. He's out on training out in the snow, one of the higher peaks, and he came across something in the snow. He said he saw it from far away at first, and when he got closer, he realized it was a shirt, frozen, and sticking part way out of the powder. He recognized it as belonging to the kid because it had a distinctive pattern. About 20 yards away, he found the kid's body, lying partially buried in the snow. My buddy said there was no way the kid could have been dead for any more than a few days, even though he'd been missing for almost three months. The cr kid was curled around something. When my buddy brushed off the snow to see what it was, he said he couldn't, almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was a big chunk of ice. Been 
crudely carved to look sort of like a person. The kiddo was holding it so tight that he had, fro had frostbitten his hands and chest, which my buddy could tell even with the decay that had taken place. He raided the rest of the crew, and they took the body off the mountains. Now, he recapped all this for me, and to put it simply, there was no way the kid could have both survived for almost three months on his own or have gotten to this peak. There's no physical way this child could have walked almost 50 miles and ended up on the top of a goddamn mountain. To top it off, there was nothing in the kid's stomach or colon. Nothing. Not even water. It's like my buddy said, the kid had been taken off the face of the earth, put in suspended animation, and dropped off on this mountain months later, only to die of exposure. He's never really gotten over that one. The last story I'll share from him was one that took place relatively recently, only a few months ago. They were out doing a a recon from Mountain Lions because there have been several reports of sightings in the last couple of days. One of our jobs is to scout out the areas where these animals are seen to ensure that they are in the area we can warn people and close off those trails. He was out on his own in a very heavily forested park, park towards dusk when he heard it sound like a woman screaming in the distance. Now, as most of you know, when a mountain lion screams, it almost sounds exactly like a woman being brutally murdered. That's unsettling, but far from abnormal. My buddy rated back and let Ops know that he'd heard one. He was going to going to keep going to see if he could figure out where its territory started. He heard the mountain lion scream a couple more times, always from the same spot, and determined the approximate area of the mountain lion's territory. He was about to head back when he heard another scream, this time with only a few yards of him. Of course, he freaks out and starts heading back at a much faster pace because the last thing he wants is to run into a goddamn mountain lion and get mauled to death. As he got back into the path and started heading back, the screaming followed him, and he broke into a jog. When he was about a mile from Ops, the screaming stopped, and he turned around to see if it was following him. It was almost night by this point. He said, but he said in the distance, just before he, the path around the corner, he could see it would look like a male figure. He called out to them, warning them the paths were closed and he needed to come back to the welcome center. The figure just stood there, and my buddy started to walk over. When he was about ten yards away, the figure took, as he described, an impossibly long step towards him, and let out the same scream my buddy had been hearing. My buddy didn't even say anything. He just turned and sprinted back to Ops, never looking behind him. By the time he got back, the screaming had moved back into the woods. He didn't mention to anyone else. He just said there was an outline in the area and that they would need to close those paths until the animal could be located and moved. I mean, that's where I'm going to end this entry here, since it's turned into a huge wall text. I'm going to be heading out on a yearly training up tomorrow morning, so I'll be gone until early next week. I'll be meeting with a lot of former trainers and buddies who work in other areas of the park, and I'll be asking about any stories they'd like to share. I'm so glad you guys have been interested in my stories, and once I'm back from the SOP, I'll continue to share them. And we're also going to go into part four. So, are you scared yet? I'm a search and rescue officer of the U.S. Forest Service. I have some stories to tell. Part four by Search and Rescue Woods. Hey guys, I'm back from my training off, and I have a lot of really interesting stories to share with you. I've got enough that I'm going to break them up into two parts. This being the first. I'd love to put them all into one entry, but I haven't had a chance to write them all down yet. I didn't have anything too crazy happen while I was out there, but we did have one incident with a rookie that I found relevant. So I'm sure you guys have been waiting for these. I'll just get right into the stories. I'll sign each batch of stories to the person who told them to me. KD. KD is a vet who's been an SAR officer for about 15 years. She specializes in high elevation mountain rescues. Is widely considered one of the best in her field. She's one of the more enthusiastic storytellers, and since we were together a fair amount during exercises, she ended up telling me about four that really stuck with me. The first she told me in response to my asking about her most traumatic calls, she shook her head and told me that really bad calls happen more frequently on the mountain, since the potential for nasty accidents is higher. About five years ago, when the park she worked at had a string of disappearances, it was a bad year, she said, one of the worst on record as far as weather went. They were getting about a foot of new snow every couple of days, and there were a few avalanches that killed some climbers. They'd warned people about staying on the mapped areas, but of course, there's always those who don't listen. In one particularly nasty case, an entire family got wiped out because the father decided he knew better than the officials. He took them out into an area that wasn't safe. They were snowshoeing, and as best as Katie could figure, they walked into a shelf of snow that looked solid, but really wasn't. It gave way. The family went ass over tea kettle, almost 300 feet down a slope, landed on the rocks at the bottom, and the parents died instantly. One of the kids did as well. But the other two survived. One had a broken leg and fractured ribs. The other was unharmed, save for some bruising and sprained ankle. The uninjured child left his sibling behind and set out, set out to try to find help. Katie said so the kid didn't make it more than half a mile before a storm overtook him. The kid stopped to try and get warm, or maybe just to rest, and ended up freezing to death. They ended up finding a family with the help of some witnesses who saw them hang out in the wilderness. 
and she was the one to find a kid who'd frozen to death looking for help. She said it started to snow, just enough to obscure long-distance vision, but not long enough to make searching impossible. She saw a figure sitting in the snow up ahead, and she got to it as quickly as possible. She described in detail how as she got closer, she realized first that it was a child, second, they were deceased, and third, that they had frozen in one of the most pitiful positions she'd ever found a corpse in. The kid was sitting upright, with his knees tucked up against his chest, his arms were curled around them, and his head was tucked up into his coat. When she moved the coat to look at his face, she saw that he died crying. His face was twisted, and the tears were frozen on his cheeks. She told me repeatedly that she hopes the father is burning in hell as we speak. The other traumatic story she told me about, in my mind, was one that happened when she was a rookie. Her team got a report of an experienced climber who hadn't come home the previous day. The wife was convinced that something bad had happened because he'd never failed to come home on time. They went out looking for him and had to climb what sounded like some very technically challenging parts of the mountain. They got to a relatively flat area. Katie started, Katie started seeing blood and snow. She followed the trail and as she went, she started seeing little bits of tissue. She wasn't exact, sure exactly what body part it had come from. But the farther she followed, the more there was. She followed this blood and tissue trail to a sheltered area under a cliff face and she finds the climber. She said there was so much blood, more than she'd ever seen before. He was lying face down, one arm stretched out in front of him, as if he'd died crawling. She looked closer and sees that he'd been partially disemboweled, which is where the t tissue had come from. This guy had an ice pick tucked in a hip holster, and it's covered in blood. Of course, they'll never be exactly sure what happened, but as she said, as best she can figure, this is what went down. The guy had been attempting to climb up the next area and had been using an, his ice axe to ascend. He probably hit a loose patch and had fallen. On the way down, or possibly when he landed, he got gotten impaled by the axe and it had disemboweled him. He dragged himself along, tear tearing pieces of himself out as he went, and had died under the cliff face. She isn't terribly bothered by gore, but I guess a few of the guys who came to help her remove the body threw up when they turned him over, and a good portion of his intestines spilled out. I mentioned to her that I was interested in wanting hearing about any experiences she had of people completely disappearing. Her eyes light up, and she comes in close to me. Want to hear a real doozy? She asked. She told me how when she first started, there was a case that got a lot of attention in the media. The family had been out berry picking the area of the forest very close to the entrance of the park. They had two little boys, both under the age of five, and at some point during the day, one of them vanishes. There's an absolutely massive search, and they find absolutely nothing. It's another of those cases where it's like the kid was never there in the first place. The dog just sits down and don't, doesn't pick up on anything. No trace of the kid is found. The search goes on for about two months, but is eventually called off. Fast forward to six months later, the family comes to back to place flowers memorial that's been set up there for the kid. They bring their other son. While they're placing the flowers, they lose sight of the kid for about three seconds, and that span of time, he vanishes in the thin air. Now, obviously, the parents are beyond devastated. It's awful enough to lose one child, but to lose two is beyond imagining. The search is huge, one of the largest in the state history. There are about 300 volunteers coming every inch of this park, looking for this kid, but again, no trace of him. The search goes on for about a week, with people looking miles from part of the park that he vanished from. Then, almost two weeks later, a volunteer almost 15 miles from a designated area, search area, radios in that he's found the kid. They assume the kid was dead, but the volunteer says he's not only alive, he's in good shape. KD and her team go out to recover the kid, and when they get there, they can't believe this kid has been missing. His clothes are clean, there's no dirt on him anywhere, and he doesn't even appear traumatized. The volunteer said he found the kid sitting on a log, playing with a little twig bundle that's bound together some old rope. Katie asked him where he'd been, who he was with for two weeks, and the kid tells her he's been with the, the fuzzy man. Now, KD believes in big, firmly believes in Bigfoot. So she got all excited and asked him what he means by fuzzy. Was he hairy? But the kid says, no, he wasn't hairy. He was a fuzzy man, and describes a man that's blurry. Like, when your eyes are, close your eyes, but not all the way closed. He says the man came out of the trees and took the kid with him deep into the woods. The kid said he slept in a hollow tree, and the fuzzy man gave him berries to eat. KD asked the man was mean. If he scared the kid, and the kid says, No, he wasn't scary, but I didn't like how he didn't have eyes. KD says the kid, they get the kid back to headquarters, and the cop takes him in town to talk to him more about what happened. She's friends with the cop that talked to him, and she said that the kid described being kept in the street by the fuzzy man and given berries whenever he was hungry. He was allowed to wander around a very specific clearing, but when he tried to go further, the fuzzy man would get, get mad and yell real loud even though he didn't have a mouth. When the kid got scared at night, the fuzzy man made it go brighter and gave him the twig bundle. He said the fuzzy man was going to keep him, but he had to let him go because the kid wasn't the right kind. He either can't or won't elaborate more on that. The cops are left, sort of left scratching their heads, and search, the search for his brother is renewed with no results. The kid has no idea where his brother might be, and they never find him. The last story that Katie told me was 
of something that happened to her when she got separated from her training group when she was a rookie. They were learning the basics of high elevation ele- 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 belaying on a well mapped side of the mountain, and she had to use the bathroom. She walked, went off about 50 yards from the group during a meal break and did her business. I'll tell the rest exactly as she told me. So I got to take a piss, and once I'm done, I start going back to the group, but I've gotten only about 5 feet when I realized that I have no idea where I am. This wasn't a, oh, I got turned around lost. I mean, I had literally no fucking clue where I was. If you'd asked me, I, w- I don't even think I'd have been able to tell you what state we were in. I was sort of how I imagine people with amnesia feel, you know? You're completely lost, you have no idea what to do. So I just stood there for a while, just trying to figure out where the fuck I was and what I was supposed to be doing. But the longer I stand there, the more confused and turned around I get, so I start walking. As I recall, I just picked a random direction and went for it. And as I'm walking, it gets worse and worse, to the point where I have no concept of why I'm on the mountain in the first place. I'm just trudging through the snow. Then I start hearing this voice, kind of inside my head almost, like if a frog could talk all low and croaky and it keeps telling me over and over, it's okay, you just need to find something to eat, find something to eat and you'll be okay. Just keep walking and find something to eat, eat, eat. I started looking around for anything I can eat and I swear to God, I've never felt that hungry in my whole life. It was bottomless. I think I'd have eaten just about anything you put in front of me then. I had no concept of time, so I had no idea how long I'd been out when I hear an actual voice coming towards me. I go towards it and see one of the other SARs, and he looks fucking terrified. He's running towards me, asking if I'm okay and what the hell I'm doing out here. The scary thing was, as he's running towards me, I kind of see myself reaching to my belt for my hunting knife. I'm not even really thinking about what I'm doing. What I'm thinking is that I have to eat. If I don't eat, I'll never be okay again, so I just have to eat. He sees me doing that and backs off right away. He yells at me to put my knife down that he's not going to hurt me. And that kind of snaps him back. All of a sudden, I know exactly where I am and I put the knife away. I run to him and ask him how long I've been gone. Thinking he's telling me I've been gone for half an hour or so. He tells me I've been gone for two fucking days. I've gone over two peaks and ended up almost on the other, almost on the other side of the mountain. And if I kept going, I would have ended up wandering into about 300 miles of wilderness. They never found me. He can't believe I'm not dead. And of course, I don't know what the fuck to think. To me, no time has passed at all. I don't say anything. I just go back to the rendezvous point, and I'm taken back to HQ to be airlifted to a hospital. When I get there, they do all kinds of tests to try to figure out what happened. Uh, best thing, yes, I had some sort of weird fugue state, where it's kind of like amnesia, or a weird seizure that knocked my brain out of whack. The truth is, we really don't know. It's never happened again, but I'll tell you, ever since then, I don't go out there alone. People rag on me for making them come with me when I have to leave the group, but I have to tell them that lis- listening to p- me pissing in the snow is better than losing me for two fucking days on a freezing mountain. E.W. Next person I talked to was E.W., a former trainer who now works as an EMT. He still comes to ops like this to help out, but doesn't work full-time for us anymore. He specializes in finding lost kids. He just seemed to have a sixth sense when it came to knowing where they'd gone. He's a legend among the more senior vets, but he gets embarrassed if you compliment him on his work. He sat down with me at dinner one evening, and we ended up swapping stories. Most of them were casual. But when we got on the subject of our more weirder calls, I mentioned that I had a buddy who'd gone up a set of stairs. He got kind of quiet and asked if I'd heard a little boy who disappeared from his park a few years back. I hadn't, so he told me the story. They're out looking for this 11-year-old boy, Joey, who'd gone missing near a river. Of course, the first thing that was that he'd fallen and drowned, but when they brought the dogs out, they let SAR officers away from the river and into a very densely forested area. When we do searches for people, we search in a grid pattern, and we search every box of the grid incredibly thoroughly. What ESW's team noticed right away was that a very strange pattern was emerging, Dogs in alternate boxes were picking up Joey's scent, but losing it when they overlapped with another box. If you think of a checkerboard, Joey's scent was being picked up in random black squares, but never in red. This, of course, didn't make any sense. How could the kid bound from area air without leaving a scent in each place he passed? E.W. and his partner pass into a new box of the grid, and E.W. notices a set of stairs about 50 yards away. He tells his partner that they need to go check near it, but his partner flat out refused. He tells E.W. that he's made it a point never to go near any stairs he sees. And that while it may be routine, he's not going to pretend that it's normal. He tells E.W. that he'll wait in sight while E.W. checks. E.W. says he was irritated, but he felt for the guy and didn't push him on the subject. Walk towards the stairs. They're small, kind of like stairs into a basement. I don't really feel strongly one or the other about them, the stairs, I mean, so I wasn't scared of anything. I guess I'm like everyone else. I just prefer not to think about them too much. Anyway, I went over and I could see that there was something lying on the bottom step, sort of curled up. My heart sinks, because of course you always hope for the best, and we were confident we'd find this kid alive. Because he'd only been missing for a few hours, but I knew right away that it was him, that he was dead. 
He was curled up in a little ball on the step, holding his stomach. It looked like he'd been in horrible pain when he died, but I didn't see any blood, save on some, except some on his lips and chin. I radioed him and I found him, and we got his body back to command. That poor family. They were devastated. Parents could understand how he'd be dead, because he'd only been gone for such a short amount of time. And on top of that, we didn't have any obvious cause of death, which made it worse. I figured he'd probably eaten something poisonous since he was holding his stomach when I found him. But I didn't want to guess. It's hard enough to hear that your kid's dead, let alone have some stupid SAR guy guessing about what happened. I took him away, and I went home and tried not to think about it. I hate finding dead kids, man. I love this job, but it's one of the reasons I left. We got two daughters, and thought I'm losing them that way. He choked a little here. I'm not great with emotional stuff like that, and it's always sort of awkward to see a grown man cry, so I didn't really know what to do. Pulled himself together eventually, though, and kept going. We didn't always see it back from the corner about the cause of death. It's not really our job now, I guess, and if sometimes they think it's foul play, they won't tell us because of legal bullshit. But I got a friend who works at the sheriff's department, and he'll usually pass along any interesting info I, if I ask. In this case, though, I actually got a call from him about a week later. He asked if I remember the kid, and of course, I do. And he says some seriously weird shit is going on. He tells me, you double man, you're going to think I'm crazy, but the coroner has no idea what happened to this kid. He's never seen anything like it. My friend goes on to tell me that when the coroner opened the kid up, he couldn't believe what he was saying. The kid's organs were like Swiss cheese. Quarter-sized holes were punched clean through about every single or organ this kid had, aside from his heart and his lungs. But his colon, his stomach, his kidneys, and even one of his testicles were full of clean holes. My friend said the coroner described it as if someone had taken a hole punch and punched holes out of everything. They were so neat. The kid didn't have a scratch on him. No entry or exit wounds. The closest anyone there had ever been seen like it was a guy who'd filled himself full of buckshot a year or so back while cleaning his rifle. No one had a clue what could have possibly caused it. My friend asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like it, or if we'd have similar if we'd had similar cases in the past. But I've never heard of something like that, and I told her I wasn't going to be of any help to him. As far as I know, the coroner determined the cause of death as something like massive internal bleeding. But no one knows what really happened. I've never been able to forget that kid. I have nightmares about it sometimes. I don't let my kids go into the woods alone. And when we go together, I never let them out of my sight. I used to love it there. But that case and a couple of others just sort of ruined it for me. Dinner was over, so we started to clean up and go back to our cabins. Before we went our separate ways, he put his hand on my shoulder and looked at me really close. He told me, there's bad things out there. Things I don't care if we have families or lives. Or that we can think and feel. He tells me to be careful, and he walks away. I didn't get a chance to talk to him again. That story stuck with me. PB, by pure coincidence, I got to talking to another vet, PB, who's been in the SAR field for years. We partnered on a grid sweep. And we partnered on a grid sweep uh, during a training exercise. We were chatting casually about how we liked the job, what kinds of things we'd seen, and the like. At one point, we passed an old set of stairs. Though these were probably from an old fire lookout, given the area we were in. I sort of casually mentioned that I was curious about the stairs, and I wished I knew more about them. He got kind of quiet, and looked like he wanted to tell me something, but wasn't sure if he should. Finally, he told me to turn my radio off. Obviously, that's something we were never, ever supposed to do, but I did it. He did the same. About seven years ago, he tells me he was on a call out with a rookie. They were in a part of the area, area of the park that's seen a lot of strange reports and events, disappearances, stories about lights in the forest, ad noises, things like that. The rookie was really spooked, going on and on about things in the woods. According to PB, the guy won't stop talking about the goat man. Just on and on, goat man this and goat man that. Finally, I told him that there was plenty else to be afraid of out here that was very real. And he better get over this thing with the goat man. The rookie wanted to know what kinds of things I was talking about. And I just told him to shut up and walk. We crossed a little ridge and there was a staircase about ten yards ahead. The rookie stops dead in his tracks and just stands there looking at them. I tell him, see, that's something you should be afraid of. The rookie asked me what the hell that these are doing out here, and for some reason, I just open up and tell them the truth, or what I've been told is the truth. I could have gotten in a lot of trouble for not doing for doing what I did, and I could have gotten, gotten a lot of trouble for repeating it to you, but you're a nice kid, and I want you to stop looking into this. Quit all your head. So, I'll tell you what I know. Under the condition that you never breathe a word of this to the soups. I told him I wouldn't say a word, and he double-checks their radios are off. When I first started out, we were a little less tight-lipped about them. And other things that happened out here. We warned people before they were even hired that there was some weird shit going on. I guess the Forest Service tired of having such a massive turnover rate. They wanted people to know what they were getting themselves into. So they started having people sign these agreements that they wouldn't go to the media about what they were going to see. The FS didn't want to scare people away, so the last thing they needed was spooked rookies running off the media about the stories of ghosts and haunted stairs. But eventually they found out that the agreements 
weren't necessary. People not only didn't want to talk about what they saw, they wouldn't. A few times, media tried to talk to people when kids are happy to disappear and no one would say a word. Can't even really explain it. I guess we just don't really want to admit anything is wrong. It's This is our job, to be out in the woods every single day. We don't need to be spooked. The best way I can, to avoid that is to pretend like everything's okay. So I'll tell you everything I can think of. And after that, I'm done talking about it for good. And I expect you not to bring it up around me, ever. The stairs have been out here as long as the parks have existed. The recorded going back decades describing them. Sometimes people go up them and nothing happens. Other times, look, I really don't like talking about this, but sometimes really bad shit happens. I saw one guy got his hand sliced clean off when he got the top step. Reached out to touch a tree branch and it happened so fast. One second the sand is there. Next, it was gone. Completely clean wound. Didn't find his hand. The guy almost died. Another time, a woman touched one of her stairs and a blood vessel in her brain exploded. Literally exploded like a water balloon. She sort of stumbled over and came over to me and all she got was, I think something is wrong with me. She dropped like a sack of flour dead before she hit the ground. I'll never forget the way the blood leaked inside of her eyes before she died. I watched it turn red. I watched it happen. There wasn't a single thing I could do to help. We warn people not to go anywhere near them, but there's always at least one idiot who does. And even if nothing happens then, something bad always happens. Kid goes missing as we're on the trail. Someone dies the next day. Cutting can happen in a completely safe part of the park. I don't know why, but something bad always happens. I don't know exactly why they're out here, but it doesn't matter. They're here, and if we're smart, we tell our new officers exactly what they're capable of. We both go quiet for a little while. I was afraid to talk because I wasn't sure if he was done. He looked like he wanted to say something else. Finally, he spoke up again. Have you noticed I can't find the same ones twice? I nodded, expecting him to continue. He just stayed quiet. Walked alongside me, and eventually he told me a story about the biggest deer he'd ever seen in the park. I didn't bring up the subject again, and I didn't press him for any more stories. He dropped out of the OP the next day. Apparently, he left before the sun came up, said he was sick. None of us have heard from him since he left. I'm going to stop here for the time being. I'll try and pose, pose the next part in the coming days, but with it being the end of summer, things are pretty busy here. Thanks for the continued interest, guys. You really awakened this curiosity in me that I didn't know I had. And that's where I'm going to end this episode, the Ravenettes. I hope you enjoy the nightmares.